in. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? Pretty shocking when you think about it. They spend about $60 billion a year in the pet industry in the United States. In the pet industry. $60 billion a year. That's more than the GDP of many countries, isn't it? It's pretty amazing. Well, my name is Dr. Peter Banfi, and this is my, my wife and help meet Cherie. And we are missionaries to the people and country of Burma, which for about 60 years was closed to the world and just recently opened up. I want to thank you, Pastor, and, and the church for the willingness to hear our burden and uh, for the lost souls of the country of Burma. Burma is part of that 1040 window. And I was looking at it as of 2005. Do you know how many independent Baptist missionaries were in Burma? According to reports, one. And how many independent Baptist missionaries are there in the world sent out from the United States? About 2,500. And of those, about, I think it's 565 go to places in Asia like in China. That's one for every 5.5 million people. There's a problem here. It's an imbalance. And we want to thank you for allowing us to, to speak about this. And I'd, I'd like to first give my testimony, but I think with the time, I'm going to move forward and talk about um, the mission itself and what we've done there and what's going on. My wife and I have a profound burden for lost souls in Burma. It is a very dark place under Satan's control. It indeed is. I'm blessed with a wife that loves to pray and loves the Lord and prays for me on her knees when I'm in Burma. The last time I was there, and it, it was a great comfort to me knowing that. Uh, I love her, and thank you very much for uh, giving me a wife like that, Lord. And I'm so blessed that we're taking this journey together. In Romans 15, 20 to 21, it says, Yea, so if I strive to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Burma is a place just like that. I remember being up in the hills there and, and I'd go into tribal areas and they'd say, we've never seen a foreigner. That's what's a Bible. And they were afraid of it. I remember the one lady told me she didn't want to touch it. By the end of giving her the gospel, this lady who was a sayah, a teacher, said, I'll, I'll take one of your Bibles and I'll allow you to use my, my house here to bring the children in from the community and tell them about Jesus. Praise the Lord. So Oswald J. Smith said, we talk about the second coming of Christ when half of the world has never even heard about the first coming of Christ. Over 99% of the majority ethnic Baymar people, as well as a million more in tribal villages, are unreached for the gospel and have never ever seen a Bible. It is full of idolatry and spirit houses, demonic worship, some pretty scary stories, hair-raising stories that you can hear about what we've seen, what, what's going on in Burma. It is a key time in Burma. They've opened the doors, and they just voted in a democratic government, a nominal democratic government. It's making progress. It's still going to take time. And they're still harassing the villages up in the tribal regions, but there's, there's an opportunity here. It's a window of opportunity God has given us. And if we don't go in, I read a communique from the Mormon church. The Mormon church said it's time to go into Burma. They're sending in Mormon missionaries. They have, I believe it is 80,000 world missionaries. They're highly well financed. And what they do is they bring rice into a village and fix your roof and play with your children. And then two or three weeks later, they tell you how you can become a god. We need to get into Burma now, at this point, this window of opportunity, and tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel. I'm burdened with the Lord to plant churches there and reach and train the lost in Burma, especially the young and especially particularly the fatherless, which it tells us in James 1.27 that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. To visit. God puts himself eight times in the Old Testament, eight times as the defender of the fatherless and the defender of the widow. There's a reason God's speaking to us. It's something we're to do. If you remember the story of George Mueller, I'm sure all of you are probably familiar with this, this great missionary who set up all of the, um, the orphanages in England. Well, um, due to tragic circumstances, there are many orphans there. Part of Burma is part of the Golden Triangle, and so they're growing poppies and growing drugs, and one of the problems, one of the offshoots, one of the, the artifacts of that is that their own people are becoming addicted to drugs. And so they're abandoning their children and walking away from them. And the average salary, the average monthly or yearly income in, in Burma is $250. So they're abandoning their children and just leaving them and walking away. And if you add to that the fact that the government is going in and burning out villages and harassing the tribal, tribal areas, you can see a real formula, a real problem for a lot of children there. They've got 100,000 Burmese refugees who have fled across the border into Thailand or are almost prisoners there, almost prisoners there in refugee camps with no hope 
and no gospel. These orphan children are part of a generation which is being lost to the devil. Many end up in human slavery, many as street children, and many in the sex trade. These are young children. They're sold as merchandise. We believe it's our calling to preach the gospel to these young people and prepare the next generation of Burmese evangelists, pastors, missionaries, and Christian school teachers. D.L. Moody said if he had his life to live over again, he would dedicate it all to children. Planting churches doesn't start with buildings, and we all know that. You can have a building and it remains vacant. In England, there are hundreds and hundreds of chapels and buildings remaining vacant, and many of them turned into mosques, and some of them to seek temples, including John Wesley, one of his temples, one of his, uh, his uh, churches. But it starts with shepherds, training shepherds who then gather sheep, under shepherds for the Lord. We need to train people to go out and, and evangelize their own people. The most effective way of evangelizing a people is to train their own people to go back with the gospel into their own country. So I've had the privilege of working for a school that's been one of the great church planning institutions of our day, the Crown College. They have 4,000 graduates on, in every state and on every continent planning churches. When in Burma, I visited a Baptist seminary, a Baptist seminary where the majority of the students were ex-drug addicts. 60% of the men that were there, and I had a picture of them, were I had AIDS. I had the pleasure of talking with them. And it's just amazing. They were taking classes in the seminary, and without drugs, without the help of the government, they had broken their addictions only with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all they needed. And the amazing thing was they had a hospice there. That was the place where they would take the people that were dying, and the place that it was empty. And it even looked like there was dust on the beds, because no one was dying. And these young men were finishing seminary, and here's the thing, and before you judge them, let me explain something to you from 1 Corinthians 1.26, but we'll get there. It, they were going out and planting churches. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.26, says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base, the lowest things of the world, the lowest things of the world, that no flesh should glory in His presence. You know something, when people ask you, in this world we're facing this dilemma right now with homosexuality and other things, and there's one thing when someone tells you and they ask you, they said, I was born this way, you just tell them you were. Because we're all born sinners. I was born with the potential, before we get too proud, I was born with the potential to be a murderer, to be a drug addict, yeah. to be any other person. I was born that way, but God saved me, gloriously. Amen. So these young men are saved from their addictions, and they go out and plant churches. <laughs> My heart was touched when I was there. So we must also train existing pastors. Planting churches without training shepherds can end in disaster. In Africa, the saying goes, plant an independent Baptist church, come back a year later, and you'll have a charismatic church. reason for that is they don't have doctrinal training about sign gifts and other things, and they need that training. The Lord put on my heart to start writing uh, little books, smaller books, and I finished a book on the deity of Christ, and I had a man out in California who was a Burmese... Um, uh, it was an, a Master of Divinity student, and he translated it into Burmese, and then I was able to give a pastor's college there, and I taught them about the cults, about uh, Mormons, and about Jehovah's Witnesses, distributed the book on the deity of Christ. Uh, it's just it's such a pleasure to do that. I'm writing one right now on the Trinity. If they can get the deity of Christ down, they can argue anything, including the Trinity. They must understand this foundational concept of our faith, that Christ is God. What it says in 1 John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hebrews 1, 8. And it also tells us in, in Isaiah 7, 14. And it tells us again in Isaiah 9, 6. It tells us in Colossians that He was Creator. We can go on and on and on. But God leaves us breadcrumbs all the way from the cross to the throne that Jesus Christ was God. Amen. And they need to know this, because without it, our salvation was purchased by a man, and therefore it doesn't stand and we're still dead in our sins. It took a holy lamb to die for us. In order to accomplish this, I want to build two sites, one in Pago region, Burma, and also one in Mesot, Thailand. And the one in Mesot is for those 100,000 Burmese refugees. Each site will have an orphanage and a place for widows to live and a Bible school. Not necessarily a Christian school, but a Bible school. I want to focus in on the Bible, Bible history, Bible memory, uh, learning the books of the Bible, how to preach the Bible, how to teach the Bible and a church, and a church run by a local pastor, and a Bible institute to teach the pastors in the local region, to bring them in from their, their regions, in for you know, small um, two-week courses, three-week courses, as long as they can stay on different issues about the doctrines of our faith, and to solidify them so they can go back and teach their... I, I remember this, this story about a, a Burmese pastor, and they had a New World Translation. Anybody knows that? That's the Jehovah's Witness book. 
It's called, all they had was that, no other Bible. So they said, we had to use it, we had no Bible. And we know the Jehovah's Witness Bible has a lot of heresy in it. For example, in John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Right. right. But they had to use that Bible. These men need to know. And I watched their eyes open up and see them scurrying through scriptures as they're learning about Jesus Christ as deity. We need to teach them. We plan to, to, to make the, the uh, different sites self-sustaining. I want to help them teach them how to grow crops and raise pigs and chickens and to be able to work with their hands as God said in Genesis for all of us to learn to take care of their sel themselves and know where their food came from. I'm so excited about being used by the Lord to build these Bible schools. I have 25 years in teaching. I want to take this if God will use it. He doesn't have to use it. He can tell me I don't want to use it. I'll use anything. And whatever he tells me to do, I will do. But he's given me this, this, this ability to, or desire to teach, and I want to teach them. And I want to make one point very clear. If we abandon these young people, if we abandon them, Satan will take what we abandon. He's waiting for the sick. He's waiting for those who are weak. And we're commanded in James 1.27. In addition, it is our goal to identify faithful Burmese Christians. I just had a friend of mine, uh, Daniel Weithong, a young man who's uh, about in his 30s, a wonderful preacher from Burma, from the Renka tribe up in Matupi town in Chin State. And he just took off, just disappeared. He told me, I'm going, I have to go in. He went in deep. And he went to all the different places where the handicapped were, the blind, those who were ill, and he preached the gospel to them for the summer, just going from town to town by foot. And now let me tell you, he asked me to come up to Matupi town and to teach there and to do a, um, a pastor's conference and youth revival. I have to go up a mountain 11 hours. And the only way to get up there is usually on motorcycle. And people pray before they go up this road. I'm telling him I'm praying about it. And I'll, I'll pray about it. And if the Lord tells me to go, I will go. But um, that was one of the... They, they said when the missionaries first got to Matupi Town, they said it was one of the least civilized places they'd ever been to on earth. It's way up in nowhere land. If you'd seen, there's some movies on it on YouTube to see people going up on the buses. Kind of scary. But I know the Lord will be with us. During the last year, the Lord blessed with the pastor's conference there. And we taught at two Baptist orphanages and schools. And I taught, uh, we had a, a verse competition. And one of the young ladies there, this will warm your heart. She got up, she did, first of all, she quoted Matthew 5, 6, and 7. She quoted 1 John 4, 7 through 12. She quoted 30 verses on the deity of Christ. She quoted about 25 verses on, on witnessing. And then she stopped and hesitated. And then did it all in English. They don't speak English, but she memorized it all for me in English. Every word. It is so beautiful in every language, but John 3.16 is Piatakani Tarogo, Yonchi Dolto Apalo di Piasichi Tomeao, Taurata Guzia Yasichinga, Piatakani Mimi Nai Tabadi Totarogo, Sunomo de Tao, Loki Tarogo Chidomui. Loki means the world, and Chidomo means love. For God so loved the world. When they hear that, it's something brand new for them. And it's beautiful in every single language. We have a great Bible, a Judson Bible, and he used the same text that we did for the KJV to translate. He learned Hebrew and Greek and Burmese. He was a mental giant. And he took almost 30 years and he put together a Bible, a wonderful Bible, so we're very fortunate. One of my tours to, to Mon State uh, was in a bus, and these buses are basically um, pickup trucks with seats in the back. We used to take our, the head things you put on yourself in the airplane, and we'd sit on them during the day, because at the end of the day, we'd get up and say, oh, go back to our, to our rooms and lay down. It was so painful. They bounced so much. The roads? I don't know if you call them roads. They're rocks. <laughs> and it was painful. But anyway, we were on this bus. We hung up this speaker, that little speaker right here, and I blared the gospel in Burmese to them. A Buddhist was on there, toothless. These Buddhists are wicked, wicked men. There's a lot of sodomy and a lot of very bad things going on with the Buddhist monks. They're wicked people. And he's on there, toothless, grinning, listening to it. I remember that. And all of a sudden, a lady who got this, was hearing the gospel from us and heard this blaring, she was a Buddhist, devout Buddhist. She stood up and said, I need Jesus. I was just right, elated. We stood outside the bus and she accepted Christ. But here's the beautiful thing. She invited us that day to go to her house. That day, she said, come to my house. I want you to preach the whole thing to my family. And we did. But listen to this. On my way back to the car, she, hold, she held a parasol, an umbrella over my head to protect me from the sun. And all the way to the truck, she's saying, a burden is lifted off of me. A burden is lifted off of me. When people get saved there, it's giving up everything. Their families, it's giving up their holidays, it's giving up their foods, it's giving up everything. And a burden was lifted off of her? Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise Him.
A wonderful story. I found the uh, Admiral Judson took, he would have been fired from BIMI, brother. He would have. It took him six years to get his first convert. If you can't show numbers in the first few years, they're going to drop you, right? It would have been the end of Dad and Aaron Judson. But it took him six years, and he had his first convert. I found the track that he used for his first convert. We updated it, and I, had a, I got it from the, Tex the um, Baptist Theological Seminary of Texas. I had a man translate it, and we put it on a beautiful track. It's, it's very in-depth, three pages long. And then we put Bible verses in the back related to it. We printed it, and I smuggled it into Burma and got through the uh, customs without a hitch. They let me right through. And we distributed it, and they said, we want more. And so I talked to my friend, and he said, my tribal friends want to translate it. That little teeny track now is translated in four languages and is in four countries. Wow. They sent it off to India to the garment workers there. They sent it to Malaysia. It's been printed in Thailand, and it's being sent to the tribal villages in, in Burma. Praise the Lord how he multiplies things. Amen. Wonderful. So we're planning on going November, December. I'll go, and I'll look for a rental property for my wife and myself. And also looking at pieces of land, we're planning on holding a youth, a youth um, meeting or conference in Mandalay called Come and See. Remember Philip and Nathaniel? He said, Come and See. Remember the Samaritan at the well? Uh, excuse me, at the lady at the well? And then she said, she dropped her, her, her watering thing and she said, uh, I'll go tell the men to come and see. Come and see Jesus. They're going to wear t-shirts saying, come and see. Uh, they, I don't think it's going to be a problem because it doesn't have a scripture on it, but they're going to have to ask these young Christians, what does this mean? They're friends. And they're going to say, come and see. And each one is supposed to bring an animist or Buddhist friend to these meetings. At nights will be sacred hymns and, during, and preaching. And in the morning, all day, until about 2 o'clock, will be discipleship classes. And then we hand them a Bible and send them off. Not leave them out in the hot sun like a baby, just a newborn Christian, but someone that has some knowledge, right? So we're just we're just praying about that. And then we're going to be back for raising support, and we've dedicated the rest of our lives to this. And God has given us the uh, the mercy to take us and use us, and we thank Him for it. When I look at these films, every time I just start getting a smile on my face when I see those kids, and I remember those moments. Wonderful. But we can't do this ourselves. We need God's help. Please pray about partnering with us, and take a prayer card and just pray, pray for us. I just want to tell you in, in Burmese, Piata Kankanji Pepasi. God bless you. Amen. Pastor, do you want to um, have me just preach right on from here? Yeah. Okay. You get to hear my voice again. Okay. Let's see. Do you have my Bible? Thank you, sweetheart. How could I go up there without my Bible? I'm sorry. Goodness. All right. Okay. Well, one thing is you're a blessed you're a blessed people to have a pastor that loves you, don't you? It's a special thing. I have a pastor, Pastor Sexton is quite ill right now. I've been with him for about four years. And um, he's a good man. Taught us a lot under his under his tutel, uh, under his tutoring. I've learned a lot about the Bible. But I was about to put together, I had a sermon put together in Hebrews 12 too, looking unto Jesus. And then God, as he did to me in Thailand, right when I was about to preach, it was 10 minutes before I was supposed to preach, and God said, no, you're not preaching that. And I said, God, I've got it all prepared. And he said, no, I want you to preach this, and I had to change it. Well, about three, about three days ago, God said, no, I want you to preach, preach on Moses and his excuses. Moses and the call. So I want to preach about that. The text for tonight's message comes from Exodus 3, 1 through 10. And let's, if we could stand for the reading of God's holy word. Exodus 3, verse 1 through 10. And we can just stand that and I'll give you other Bible references as we go. By the way, I'm a missionary. I love the Bible. Do you love the Bible? Amen. We're going to go through this Bible a lot tonight and learn what God tells us. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire. And the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, 
for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Please uh, note that verse, and I will send thee. Let's pray. Father God, please give me strength today to deliver your message. As you said to Jeremiah, God, I pray that you touch my mouth and put your words in my mouth. I pray for this dear church and for the pastor, God, that you'll anoint him to lead his people well. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today that's not heard your gospel, does not know you as Savior, God, that this will be the glad day. And Lord, I pray that you'll open the ears and the hearts of the people, that they might get what you have for them. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please sit down. So... One might say that Moses was called. He was sent for a divine purpose. But the people, we, we as people use this term call too liberally. We say we were called to a certain profession, or we were called to a certain college, or we were called to a mate. That may have been God's will, but every, every example of calling in the Bible is a holy calling. And it's a call to Christ. So we have to be careful not to take words that we use for one thing that have a very important meaning in the Bible and use them for another. It's a holy call. And, and I'll just, if you want to write down the scriptures, I'll probably go to a number of them a little quickly for you to flip to all of them. So just stick with me. And if you want to, write them down for reference. Uh, in 2 Timothy 1.9 it says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling. Then if we turn to Hebrews 3.1, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. It's a, a holy call. It's also a call to repentance. In Matthew 9.13, 9, the Lord says to us, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I, I am come, not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In Mark 2.17, it says the same things. It's a call to repentance. And also, it's a call to salvation. In 2 Thessalonians 2.14, the Bible says, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 2.9, That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light from sin to salvation. It's always a call to himself, uh, of himself and to himself. As he says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, come unto me all you come unto me, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And in Philippians three fourteen it says, I press towards the mark and the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And of course, the wonderful chapter in John 10, which parallels really Psalm 23, which is about Jesus being the shepherd. And he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. It's always a call to himself and of himself, and it's a call to holiness. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. The Christian life is supposed to be a victorious life. We're not supposed to be still shackled by our sin. God gives us power and victory over our sin. In Galatians 5, 16, it tells us this, I say then, walk, not in, walk then in the Spirit, and ye shall not, ye shall, you hear that word shall? It doesn't say may not, right? It says, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God will give us victory. So our text is from the book of Exodus. In Exodus, there are 40 chapters. It's part of the Pentateuch, and everyone probably knows that's the first five books of the Bible, written by they're the Jewish Torah, and written by Moses. And it's a book about redemption, the redeeming of Israel from Egyptian bondage. And it's typical of our salvation. There are three, when we say typical, it means it's like a metaphor. 
it gives us an idea or a picture of our salvation as the, as the Israelites are freed from their bondage, our freedom from our sin as Christ freed us from our sin. Remember he said he redeemed us from all iniquity and purified unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So there are three, di three divisions in Exodus. The first is Exodus chapters 1 through 18, which talk about the power of God. It reveals his power. The burning bush is Moses' first encounter with God. The first one ever. And his power is manifest in the plagues, and of course the Passover plague, taking the firstborn of, of every family and of every beast. And they told the Jews to take a, a small um, lamb without blemish and to sacrifice it and to place it on the doorpost and upon the lintel. And the death angel would pass over that house, which is the same as what Christ does for us with his blood. We're covered by his blood so that the death angel passes over us. Death no longer has any sting because God, Christ, has shed his blood for us. He showed us... Um, not only that, but he parted the sea and destroyed the uh, Pharaoh's armies. And it was also part of his provision and his power. Remember, in, in this, these three chapters, he also talks about how, the Bible talks about how he provided waters at Mara, made them sweet, and manna and quail. And he said, I, in Exodus 16, I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. The next division was division in chapters 19 to 24. And here we have the law and the holiness of God. God gives a covenant, if you will obey me, you will be my peculiar people. And if you will not, all these curses will be beaded upon you. At Mount Sinai, God came to the mountain. There was thunder and lightning and thick clouds, and whoever would touch it or gaze upon it would die. He gave the Ten Commandments and the civil laws and how people should deal with each other, the Sabbath and the feasts. And in uh, chapters, the third division, chapter 25 to 40, he gave us the tabernacle, which is a type of Christ. He gave us exact measurements. God is, God is a God of order. He tells us exactly how it's measured and exactly how to make it. Directions to build it, where he would dwell between the cherubim. The tabernacle would become the center of the nation of, Jew, of Israel's life. It would be holy. Isn't that a typical of how Christ should be the center of our lives? Remember how they were arranged around it? They had all the tribes in array in a certain spot around the tabernacle. And it was in the center and the Levites were around it. And no one could come close to the tabernacle that was a foreigner or they would die. And when they left, God had them leaving in order by their, their flag and each one would leave. God gave them and prepared the stiff-necked people with exact and detailed orders on how to live their lives to try to live by the law. Instead, they failed miserably, as we know, and as we do all the time, trying to be justified by the law and doing it ourselves. Instead, the law is supposed to be a schoolmaster to teach us. We are not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And Romans 3.19 puts it into perspective, that every mouth that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The law showed them how their sin was exceeding sinful. Exceeding sinful. So our passage that we're going to deal with here is in the first section of Exodus in which God is revealing His power and it's the first encounter with, with Moses and God. Let's talk about the context. Most of you probably know this story but for those who don't, in the context, Israel was exploiting the Jews who were in Egypt. Excuse me, the Egyptians were exploiting Israel that were afflicted by Pharaoh in Egypt. We know the story of Moses, how that God preserved him as a baby from death when Pharaoh had ordered that all the young children all the male children of the Hebrews be killed at birth. And when he was born, his mother saw that he was a goodly child and protected him. And after, for about three months, she then put him in a, an ark of bulrushes and put him in the bank when she could no longer hide him. And then Pharaoh's daughter found him and had compassion on the child and raised him up in Pharaoh's house. When he grew up, he decided to visit his people to see their burden. And he found an Egyptian smiting an Israelite and he killed the Egyptian. When Pharaoh found out that he had done it, he wanted to kill Moses. So what did Moses do? He fled to Midian. In Midian, by chance, he met the seven daughters of the priest of Midian, watering their father's flock, if you remember the story. And when the shepherds drove them away, Moses helped them and watered their flocks. And their father, Rule, was very thankful to Moses. And he ended up marrying one of his daughters, Zipporah. And they had a son named Gershom. And he was a, he was a, a shepherd. And here our story begins in this chapter 3. 
<clears throat> One day while he was watering the flock of his father-in-law at Horeb, God revealed himself for the first time in a burning bush. And this was a transformational experience for Moses. John Gill says, God declared his intent to deliver the Jews and gave him, Moses, a call to be the deliverer. God's call was crystal clear. It was with his voice. He heard him. In Exodus 3, 2, the angel of the Lord appeared in the flame in the midst of the bush. This was not a created angel, but it was God's presence. It was typical of Christ. Many times we see in the Old Testament these angels of the Lord, which are Christ-typical, or metaphors for Christ, or images of Christ. Notice that the, the bush was burned, but it was not consumed. The Jewish writers say that that typifies Israel as they came through the fire of affliction in Egypt were not consumed. But it also typifies us as Christians how Christ prepa prepares and preserves the church and also us as we go through and suffer with Christ as it tells us in Philippians 3.10. It was a general symbol of Him who was a pillar of fire by night and it tells us in Hebrews 12 verse 19 for God is a what? Consuming fire. In verse 3.3, 3, Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. It was a strange and unnatural and divine thing that he saw. And in verse 4, when the Lord Jehovah, they called him the Lord Jehovah now, that angel, now called the Lord Jehovah, saw, he turned aside. The angel then was equated with God. And we know the word Lord in capital letters is used for the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament with the Lord Jehovah. So verse 5 it says, He warned Moses, Don't draw nigh, take off your shoe, whereupon thou standest this holy ground. He was demonstrating God's greatest characteristic, from which all other characteristics come, His holiness. The shoes are dirty. In many, this is the same in many different cultures also. Remember that Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and, and Peter said, No, Lord, wash my head and my hands. He said, If your feet are clean, all is clean. On the Day of Atonement, the Jews go to their temple in bare feet. And every priest, before they would go into the holy place, would go to the laver and wash off their feet, their hands. Always. The ground wasn't unusual here. The ground was the same ground as it always was, but it was the presence of God that made it unusual. In verse 6, God announced who He was. He said, I am the God of the patriarchs, and Moses feared God. This is how we should approach God, with godly fears. It tells us in Proverbs 9, 10, fear, the, the fear of the Lord is the what? Beginning of wisdom. Amen. Then we move on to verse 7. And, and God told him, He has seen Israel's affliction and heard their cry and knew their sorrow. Remember, our Savior understands us and cares. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Our high priest knows our infirmities. The Bible says he careth for us. When we look at the world around us, it looks like it's imploding. We have to remember that God is on his throne and he hears the cry of his people. We need to cry out to him. In verse 8, God gives Moses the promise of deliverance and a new home. Just as Christ provided us, Jesus will deliver us not only from the power and penalty of sin here on earth, but someday, remember, He delivers us from the penalty of sin, right, which is death and hell, and from the power of sin, He gives us freedom, because He, as it says in Romans 8, 1 and 2, it tells us that the law, the spirit of the law of, uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. But He also someday will deliver us from the presence of sin when we are in heaven. Praise the Lord. And He says, I go to prepare a place for you. In verse 9 and 10, God heard the cry and their oppression. He said, so I will send Moses. And God went with him. When he sends us, we're not alone. And I have to pray about that on my knees all of the time. Remember, it's a great commission. Missionaries don't go alone. In Acts 1.8 it tells us, but after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he told the disciples to tarry ye. He goes with us. He walks with us when we're doing his work. The Lord called Moses in a flame in the midst of the bush. It was a holy calling. It was a call to salvation, and it was a call to him to be his peculiar treasure. But Moses had excuses. He had excuses. And God dealt with each one of them. Let's listen to his excuses. He tells us in 3.11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? What did God say? I will be with thee. You know, of course Moses is correct in feeling powerless and inadequate before God to do anything. Jesus told us in, in John 15, 5, He said, For without me you can do nothing. 
But with Him, we can do anything. It says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And, and I love this, what it says in um, Isaiah 27.4, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. We find our full sufficiency in Christ. We aren't good enough, but He is. And He will justify us. He justified us by His blood. You know, when we get to heaven, God is going to see us, and He's not going to let us into heaven because of our merit. And he's not going to look at you and say, look at all the good things you did. He's going to look at you and say, I see my son. I see my son. His blood is upon you, and He is righteous. And when we bring in our hands all the things we've done, Jesus is going to take them out of our hands one at a time and say, isn't it wonderful what I gave you? Service to me, prayer, worship, because they were gifts to us. So it's by His righteousness. Second, He said, in verse 13, Moses said, what shall I say? Who shall I say sent me? God said, I am that I am. He needed nothing more to say, but I am has sent me unto you. He is all sufficient. He exists even if nobody believes. When people tell you, if the Muslims say we don't believe in your God, we'd say wait till the day of judgment because you will believe. There will be a day when all eyes will see. It doesn't matter if we believe. God exists. And He offers us hope through Him. And we have a choice to make. God said, I am that I am. Philippians 3.10 said that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. And in Matthew 11.20 it said, learn of me. Our goal is what it tells us in 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to be known by Him and to know Him. Do you really know Him? Because in Matthew 7.23 it tells us, And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That word depart from, that being separated from the presence of God, is a, a metaphor for a devil's hell. God is prepared for the devil and his angels. Knowing him is a relationship with him, is a gift of salvation. If you don't have that gift and you don't know him today, you need to come down and come to know the Savior and look unto Christ. He said next, I have no credibility. Why are they going to believe me? Why are they going to believe me? I remember the first time I got on that plane alone, my wife, I probably thought maybe I was a little bit, a little bit nuts. And I said, I'm going to Burma now alone. I'm just going to land there. We're just going to go out and talk to people. And, and the Lord blessed. It was a wonderful thing. But I, I didn't have any credibility. But I knew God did. And I knew He was going to prepare me. God tells him, you will have power. He will give him the rod. And then he told him about the leprous hand. He said, I will go with thee. And if they don't believe this, I'll change water to blood. When we go as Christians with the gospel, we have the power of a changed life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We go with the power of a changed life. And we go with the power of the Spirit of God. But in order to be a witness, you must have been a witness. So you need to have been, you need to have witnessed the saving change in your life of Jesus Christ. Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Or are you satisfied, am I satisfied, to live a spiritless, powerless, religious life with no relationship with Christ, lost in sin, or never knowing Him my whole life? And then he said to the Lord, I have no ability to speak, I'm not eloquent. I'm not eloquent. In other words, he just said, I don't have the skills. You haven't prepared me. I, I can't do this. But it's not by our power that we go anyway. God said, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And in Jeremiah 1, 6-9, the Lord said, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And remember when Jesus was talking to us about a time of great tribulation, He said, For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. And God gives us a promise. He tells us that you're beautiful when you speak the words of God. In Romans 10, 15, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Amen. Finally, Moses had had all of his excuses addressed, but he still had one more thing to say to God. I won't do it, said somebody else. I won't do it. You've, you've counted all my excuses, but I won't do it. 
and God was angry, but then God was merciful. He provided Aaron. He said, Aaron will speak the words for you, and I'll teach you. And God said that Moses will give you the words, and will give the words to Aaron from you to speak for him. Jonah refused to do God's work and ran away from God. Remember that? The trick is, the, the, the answer is that we don't run away from God, we run toward God. Solomon, after a life of disobedience, having all but having keeping nothing, saw that it was all vanity. And he said in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. One man once said, who needs a call, who needs a call if we already have a command? God has told us to go. The Great Commission is in all four Gospels, in Matthew 28, 19, it's in Mark 16, 15, it's in Luke 24, 47, it's in John 20, 21, it's in Hebrews 1, 8. How many times do we have to hear it? Not only that, it was given to us when Jesus was in his resurrected body. He had died and come to life and gave precious words to his, these were the marching orders for his Christians. This is what I want you to do before I leave. Hear me, hear me. And then he rose and went to heaven. These are precious words that he gave us. They're what we're to do to bring the gospel to the lost world. Because you know what? The goal of missions, the goal of missions is to redeem man back to God because he loves you. And because you are the gift, you are the gift to the Son. Amen. So all the excuses we come up with all come down to lack of faith. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. If we really believed what happened on the cross, and, on, and, and our hearts really believed it, our hearts would be broken for the Savior. I've asked God before to show me hell. What a foolish man I am. What a foolish man. I remember going through this, this moment of, of, of pain and depression, and I said, Lord, Lord, I can't take any more. I can imagine what hell is like. If we knew what hell was like, if we knew that, we couldn't stop. Pastor Sexton, one hand, a Muslim man come into his church, and the Muslim man listened to, this, to his sermon about, about missions and about going and telling the gospel. He came to the front to the altar, and he stood up and he said, Pastor Sexton, and very rare, Pastor Sexton says, yeah, he said, yes. And the man spoke to the whole church and he said, I don't think you believe what you preached. Pastor Sexton said, what do you mean by that? He said, if you believed that men were going to go into a, a fiery hell and die and suffer there for eternity, you couldn't sleep day or night. Mm. Wow. How about us? Can we sleep on that pillow at night without even caring about or thinking about or doing anything about the rest of our lives? We can't be lulled into a sense of passivity. The devil, Satan, wants us not to do anything. This is an amazing time in our country to go out and tell people about the gospel the gospel that men are vile and wicked sinners from birth headed towards the devil's hell and they're worthy of death. But our holy God sent his son, born of a virgin, robed in human flesh, the second person of the Trinity, fully God and fully man, the son of God and God the son, a sinless lamb who lived a sinless life, to be humiliated for us, to be mocked and beaten, spit upon and hung on a tree, naked and bleeding, sinless but treated as a sinner, spotless but putting on the spotted, filthy garment of our sin, as it reads, says in Jude, and becoming sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was rejected by his own father. In Habakkuk 1, 30, 13, it tells us that uh, his eyes are too pure and holy to look upon sin. And Christ was the object of his eternal love. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world, Christ said. And it was because his father was too pure, he was repulsed by what his son became for us. He became this for us. He became sin. For every sinful thought or action we've ever done, every time we've been angry, the sin of every wicked or hateful word we've had, of every thought that we've had, of every lie, for every pedophile, every sodomite, every murderer, every adulterer, Christ wore the garment of that sin, past, present, and future. Every one of them. And only He, the perfect Holy Son of God, could ever die and pay for that sin once and for all. And He said, Tetelestai. That's a Greek word that was put onto business documents. And it was put onto debts that were paid. And it said, The debt was paid. Right. He paid it for us. How can we not go out and tell others about it? And then the Father's unleashed the full measure of His wrath on His own Son. And Christ 
said, Lama, Lama Thabakthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he did it for the joy. It tells us in Hebrews 12 too, the joy of redeeming lost sinners to God and they became the gift to the Christ. He became the church as the bride of Christ. It's given to him. What a wonderful thing. And we're to but look to Christ and repent of our sins and believe that he can and he will save us. And you will be born again and freed from the penalty of sin, which is death and hell, from the power of sin and from the presence of sin. And you know something? He's preparing a place for us. And he will wipe away all tears from our eyes. There will be no more, no more death, neither sorrow, no crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And in heaven, they're not going to need any lights. We're not going to need the sun, because they have the S-O-N. And we have God, which is going to be the light therein. Christ is preparing a place. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Every Christian, every Christian has a calling to the Lord and to serve the Lord. Hudson Taylor said, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. Amen. Are you making excuses not to go? Are you being like Moses? Can you think of more and more and more and more and more? I know I could. Not only to the uttermost, but to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all at the same time. This is the calling of every Christian. It's a holy calling to him. As Isaiah said to the Lord, when the Lord asked him, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah faithfully exclaimed, Here am I, send me. Are you willing to go? Young people, are you willing to go? Where God is calling you? He died for you. And there were people dying, going to a devil's hell. And the lamb that was the Moravian mission cry. You ever heard of the Moravians? They're great missionaries. And two young men decided there was an island where there were slaves on the island. And these slaves were African slaves. And no one was allowed to preach the gospel. Any Christian that went to the island, the master of the island would take them off and isolate them and then ship them off. So two young men who were Moravians decided the only way to get into that island was to sell themselves into slavery for life. They sold themselves into slavery. And as their boat left the dock and their families waving goodbye, tearing in their eyes, one of the men yelled out and held up his hand and said, The lamb that was slain is worthy of the reward of his suffering. That's why we go. We go, the lamb is worthy of the reward of his suffering. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray.